Welcome, Laszlo. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us today. So when people think of Google and its people practices, they think of free food, dogs roaming the hallways, rock climbing walls. What are all these perks for? And, and if they went away tomorrow, would it make any difference? So two thoughts. First, the reason we do all these things, not just the cafes and the dogs and kind of the fun things like massage programs, but also how we think about all our benefits and perquisites is to achieve three purposes. Number one is to create a community. So if you walk around campus, you see micro kitchens periodically across all the floors. And it's not because we think people will starve if they go a few hours without eating. It's because we think it's important to have informal places for people to interact and, and come together. The second is to drive innovation, actually. Because if you listen to the conversations people are having in those places, it's as often as not about products, about users, about how do you come up with new things. And we don't believe you can sort of force or manufacture innovation, but we do believe you can sort of create a higher likelihood of serendipity by causing people to interact more and creating an environment where people are more free to come up with ideas. The last is efficiency. So we have things like on-site oil changes, uh, on-site car wash, dry cleaning service, and that's because we want people at work to work very efficiently and be focused. But because they work so hard in their personal lives, we want them not to have to worry about it. And so we want their lives to kind of run efficiently. More broadly, though, to the second part of your question, I actually believe if you took all of that stuff away, all of the flashy bells and whistles, you would still have the same company, the same drive for creativity and innovation. And the reason is those are kind of nice enabling factors. But what really makes, I think, the company tick is this tremendous focus on data, this tremendous willingness to experiment, this tremendous focus on users, and this unbelievable assemblage of talent, which, when you put it together, creates an environment where people are constantly challenging themselves to come up with new, interesting things. For the past three years, Google has been in the top four of Fortune's best 100 companies to work for. What are the keys to motivating and engaging your employees? What Googlers tell us keeps them engaged and motivated here, more than anything else, is the mission of the company. If you talk to anybody at Google and ask them what's the mission, they'll say to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. And it's rare to find a place where everyone actually knows the mission and then they actually believe it. So there's a bit of selection, but that mission is something that I think to many people here is actually kind of a noble goal and it's inspirational, number one. Number two, there's this kind of bundled notion of both freedom and transparency and access to information. You get lots of information about what's going on, you have resources, you can try things, you can experiment, you can fail, learn from it, go on and do great things. And it's not always a comfortable environment, but it's a secure one where it's okay to fail as long as you learn from it. You started out as a management consultant and many of your staff are not from a traditional HR background. What sort of skills and capabilities do you look for when you're building your HR people team? We very deliberately set a goal of having an HR department uh, using a three-thirds model. One-third of the people we target hiring come from traditional HR backgrounds. So they're outstanding HR generalists, outstanding compensation and benefits folks, what have you. The second third we very deliberately target coming out of strategy consulting firms. Uh, we don't really pursue folks from the HR consultancies as much because what we're looking for are two things. Great problem-solving skills, and by that I specifically mean the ability to take a really messy problem, disaggregate it, and kind of drive to data-driven answers on them. Uh, and second, really deep business sense, a very deep understanding of how business actually works in the different functions. What we found is when you put those two together, the HR folks learn a tremendous amount about business and problem solving from the consultants. And the consultants get very quickly up to speed on the pattern recognition you need to be successful on the people side. The last third are people with advanced degrees in various analytic fields. So PhDs and master's degrees in operations, in physics, in statistics, in psychology, in org psych. And what they do is actually let us run all kinds of interesting experiments and kind of raise the bar on everything we do. So shifting gears a bit and thinking about the, the longer term, what do you see as the key long-term people challenges facing Google right now? I think one of, the, one of the challenges we have to face and grapple with is as we become a bigger and bigger company, how do you remain an intimate company? The challenge with that is when, when you lose intimacy, which comes from just being bigger, uh, you also tend to become less conscientious. People are less likely to do things as simple as picking up a piece of garbage on the floor, but they're also less likely to volunteer ideas. And so we do a lot of work trying to figure out how do you keep those connections tight and close. How did you react to the economic slowdown from an HR perspective? 
the economic slowdown was, I think, a challenge for Google as it was for many companies. From an HR perspective, in kind of a bizarre way, it, it was an opportunity in two ways. One was, uh, I think it's in downturns when you really have an opportunity to demonstrate who you really are and to build loyalty. And so we were very careful to make sure we did that. So for example, many companies uh, stopped doing salary increases. We continue doing salary increases. Many companies stopped doing promotions. We continue doing promotions. All these things that people kind of expect, we continued. And we were particularly careful that when people left the company, we were gracious and thoughtful. We expanded our severance benefits, for example. And when we'd had people leave and then months later other people leave, we went and reached out to the initial people if they had not gotten as good a deal as the prior people and sort of made them whole. What techniques do you employ to keep a pulse on how your people are feeling? At a high level, the way we keep track of things is we monitor retention and attrition. We look for patterns. We do have an annual employee survey, which we call Google Geist, the spirit of Google. And we get lots of qualitative feedback. There's kind of focus groups throughout the year. We have a lot of ears on the ground and kind of just listening to see what's going on. Um, we look at what people write internally and externally. What's a little distinctive is for the sort of structural things like the employee surveys, we do upward management feedback as well, which is unusual. We also, as we build all these tools, we pilot and test and have tremendous input from Googlers themselves. So our employee participation rates in our annual survey are, I think in the last year, was something like 96%, which is tremendous. And it's because Googlers actually helped shape it and build it and were involved in, in it. And then we actually do something with it. And every member of our executive team then has goals for the year tied to not some amorphous make the company feel more engaged, but a very specific, you know, there were these three issues in the sales organization that we will address this year. So it's real, it's tangible, it's bottoms up, and that helps us kind of not just find out what's going on, but actually do something about it, which then causes people to say, well, I should raise my hand and say something, because it matters. That also, by the way, is more engagement, and that's more positive, so it, there's all these kind of positive virtuous cycles spinning out of it, which, which are nice. That's interesting. So, so for your leaders and your middle managers, that must require you know, certain skills and behaviors to be able to live in this kind of uh, democratic environment. Tell us a bit more about the sorts of things that you, you, you look to develop in those, uh, in those leaders. Uh, what we find is when you join Google, many people, particularly at senior levels, have to actually unlearn behaviors. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, credibility at Google and influence does not come from title, it doesn't come from authority. It comes from your ability to articulate a position and then sort of argue it successfully. Uh, politics is crushed in the company. The worst thing you can do is be self-promoting and political. And in many organizations, there's some virtue to be able to, to know, oh, I should drop the CEO a note on this or my manager on this. Uh, here, it, it just signals that you don't get how the place works. One of the founders of Google is an immigrant, and you, yourself, are from overseas. How important is immigration and talent mobility more broadly to the success of Google? The most talented people on this planet have way more options than they've had in the past. And the cost of switching jobs is much lower than in the past. Uh, for a company like Google, being able to tap into that talent is tremendous. And it's not just opening offices in every place in the world, because there's many people who would love to stay in India, but others who want to come to the States or go to Europe or see places. So offering mobility is essential. Um, being ubiquitous in terms of your office footprint is essential. And then creating an environment that resonates with these people is absolutely vital. Because if you don't do that, they'll just go work someplace where they can express themselves, where they can be free. If you picked up a Googler from one side of the world and dropped them down in a Google office on the other side of the world, would it feel any different? It would feel distinctly different, but you would be absolutely sure you're at Google and not someplace else. Thank you very much, Laszlo, for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Great.